we'll begin our talk now. The title is Trees with Symmetries. Ready? Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll start. Okay, uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, the talk today is about groups acting on trees. And uh, the main theorem I'm going to hopefully be uh, hopefully prove to it is that if you have a free group, then any subgroup of it is, is already is out, uh, it's also free. Um, so let me start. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with concepts like groups, uh, fundamental groups, and the covering spaces. This talk might be quite elementary because the theorem can be proven in like a couple of lines, I think. But it's still kind of interesting to know. It's a it's a fun proof. Okay, um, I'll start from the basics. So, uh, definition of a group. A group is a set equipped with a binary operation, which we call multi multiplication. Uh, I denoted by dot here, it satisfies the properties. Um, first, associativity, which is the usual rule you guys are familiar with as the usual multiplication. And the second is the existence of a, a unity element. So multiplying by this element doesn't do anything. And the third is the existence of an inverse limit. Oh, sorry, inverse element, as I wrote here. So that's the formal definition of a group as a set equipped with an algebraic structure. Uh, sorry, the right hand side of your notes is not visible. Oh, uh, so you can only see the uh, up to like. For example, a multiplication on the first line, only MU is visible. Oh, uh, okay. No, so you can you can see a web page or no? No, I see I see everything except like a little bit of the right hand side of the page. I see. Uh, let me let me try to. Okay, how about the, this? One? Yep. Now I see the yeah. Ah, uh, so okay. Let me let me let me try to. I'm trying to see if this can be changed. Switch that up. Okay, how about this okay, now? Awesome. That's yep. better. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, let me know at any point if any portion of this node is not visible. Sure. All right, so we have the definition of the group and we'll usually just write G instead of G with the multiplication just for notational convenience. And similarly, we'll just write X, Y instead of X dot Y for multiplication. And uh, the so this is an abstract definition, but what's the idea of this concept? It's something that measures uh, symmetry. So just as numbers measure size, we know that groups measure symmetry is like a slogan. So what I mean is, what does symmetry mean? So consider, for example, a geometric element. Let me take this example, uh, say a butterfly here. Um, it has some symmetries. What I mean is a map of this shape, a butterfly to itself, which does not change the shape of it. For example, it has an obvious center axis and we can reflect this geometric uh, object to itself along the center axis, doesn't change this um, shape, the shape of this object. Uh, uh, we are not seeing if you are, if you are showing any pictures. Uh, you can see the butterfly. No, no, no. We see up to up to uh, where it says number measures size. Oh, uh, like up to the green line. I see. So, so maybe if you scroll down on the right hand side, we will see. 
Ah, oh, well. Are you okay. using something other than OneNote? I guess I'm opening OneNote on the web and then I opened an in the application. Okay, so sorry. Let me let me let me just share a screen directly, the entire screen. Okay, now you can see everything. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. Maybe this is better. Yeah. All right. So take this as an example. We have this better. Oh, okay. Also, let me know at any point if you guys think this is too elementary, and if all of the audiences here know this very well, then I can just uh, go faster, skip things. Um. I mean, everyone can feel free to ask questions if they don't understand. So you could, if you want to speed up, you could, but. If anyone has any question, please feel free to ask your questions. Okay. Yeah, so um, for example, this butterfly has this symmetry and uh, we can define its symmetry group, which as a set consists of two elements. The first is the identity. The second is just this reflection. And the multiplication is given by composing of those symmetries as maps. So for example, we compose this reflection with itself, just reflect this picture twice and we get the identity map. So we can just write down all of the possible multiplications and this defines a group. General, if we have some sort of mathematical object like a set with some structure and uh, we can talk about its symmetry group which as I said, is the collection of all of the symmetries of it. And the group structure can be naturally given because when you compose two symmetries, you're essentially composing two maps. You get another map, which also preserve the structure of the object. So the symmetry, the set of symmetry of any, uh, vaguely speaking, mathematical object is a, is a group. That's what it means by group measures symmetry. Another example here is the dihedral group Dn, which is a symmetry group of a regular polygon with n edges. For example, I drew a, uh, what do call it, a pentagon here. The group has, uh, so, so we have this symmetry, which is rotation counterclockwise by 2 pi over n degree, the yellow arrow here. We also have the reflection along the blue axis. Both of these are maps from this uh, regular polygon to itself, which preserves the shape of it. So they're both symmetries of it. And we can, compil we can compose them in all possible ways, like R composed with S, S composed with R, R composed itself, like K times, and R S, R S, R S, and so on. Uh, but you can check that if we compose S with R, we get the same thing as you compose R with itself n minus 1 times and then compose with S. The same thing if you compose R with itself n times, you just rotate it once, twice, and three, four times until n times, it gets back to itself. And so that's the identity map. In this way, you can write uh, any element in this set of uh, in the set of symmetries in uh, one of uh, this this elements so as a set this is the set of the dihedral group and the multiplication you can just compute for example if you multiply r squared with s r cubed uh, you use these two rules to get r times Rs, because we have associativity times R cubed, and Rs is Sr, uh, we take this n equals to five example, it's R times Sr to the fourth, it's R cubed. Uh, so we have an Rs here again, so Rs times R to the seventh, this is Sr to the fourth again, so R to the fifth one, so R to the seventh is just R squared. So we get uh, finally Sr here. Uh, examples of groups. Hopefully this is clear to everyone. Uh, and we can define an isomorphism between groups as a map F between two groups G1 and G2 such that um, it's a bijection as 
as a map between sets, sends the identity element to the identity element, and it preserves multiplication, which means you have uh, two elements, x, y in G1, and they're got mapped to f of x, and um, f of y in G2. Uh, then you compose them, you have x, y here, uh, it's mapped to, you compose this to f of uh, x, uh, f of y. Okay. So that, that just means that this map preserves the algebraic structure of these two groups. So basically it means that you can view these two groups as uh, the same thing by this as one of the map. And later on, we might just say two groups are the same vaguely, which means that they are actually isomorphic. Okay, so let's have three groups and the relations. If we have a set, I'll default, if we have a set X, let me define the free group generated by X, denoted by F sub X as follows. So as a set, it's the, uh, it's the set X, it consists of elements of the shape X1 to the M1, X2 to the M2, so on, Xn to the Mn, just a sequence with elements in X to the some power, uh, such that each of this power is now zero, each of these elements is in X and the uh, two consecutive elements are not the same. Uh, the, way you, the way you think of that, and, and the multiplication is just given by a uh, string concatenation. You have such an element, you have another such element, you just put one after the other, and that gives you multiplication. Of course, this guy doesn't necessarily satisfy this property because XM might be the same as Y1. In this case, you just do a reduction. Uh, when, whenever you see x to the m, x to the k, you, you replace it by x to the m plus k. Whenever you see x to zero, you can just remove remove it from, from this string. Uh, the way you think of this is you can think of, you can take, for example, x to be the alphabet. Say x is the set of the 26 English letters. And we have the set of words which is just all of the possible, you know, you can put all of the letters together in, in, a, in a string, uh, and that's a, an uh, I'll call it a word. So for example, you might have something like A, oops, A, 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 B, E, uh, E inverse, F, uh, A again. So you put them in a string. Oh, note that you can also have something to the inverse. That's something that's a little bit different from just uh, the usual English words. And uh, whenever we see something like a, 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 we just write A cubed instead. Whenever we see E, E minus, E to the minus one, we just write E to the zero, which can further be just omitted from the word. So this word can be reduced to A cubed, B, F, A. Okay, so you just you just have the element the, the elements of this free group are just words like this, and you can identify words by using reduction, and multiplication is by putting one after the other. You can manipulate those words this way. That's the definition of a free group generated by a set. Uh, here's another example. If you have only three letters, those are words, and when you mul multiply them together, you put one after the other, like this, and this guy became zero, became nothing. Move it, and you have uh, this left. This guy became uh, becomes nothing uh, as well. So you get a B squared. You can check this. This is indeed a group. Associativity is something that uh, kind of intuitively clear, but you do need a couple of lines to to justify 
because if you have a, a word one multiplied by word two multiplied by word three equals to word one multiplied by word two three so you, if you just put one after the other you get word one word two word word three this is a long word you have different orders to do reduction you can reduct this part first or you can reduct this part first it's kind of just some technical easy argument you need to work out but uh, it, it is not that obvious we skip here and you have the identity element which is just the empty word know that we allow n to be zero here so you can have something that's just empty the inverse is obviously given this way okay uh, any questions so far Okay, hopefully everything's fine. Then we have uh, a set X and the free group generated by X as above. We can uh, define some more examples of groups by using relations or I wrote or by using rules here. So a, a rule is just you can, uh, an equation that some word, this is a word, this isn't a word, a word equals to another word. You can impose like manually some word, uh, some rules to this free group and you get a new group. So uh, we can write, a, we can write this new group like this, which is defined to be as a collection, it's a set as a set, it's a collection of words, but uh, you can reduct some of them by using by, by using these rules. Which means if, if in, a, in a word you see part of it is W1, you can substitute W2 by W1. And so on. Um, yeah, of course you can do the reduction just as before, but you have these new rules as well. An example is the dihedral group that we just talked before. It it can be viewed as uh, the quotient, or so such a thing is called a quotient of the free group. So this this guy is the quotient of the free group generated by two elements, uh, quotiented by these two rules. So elements of dn are words like, you know, uh, r, s, r squared, s to negative three, and so on, so word, and you can reduce, maybe s squared, and you can reduce this word by using these two relations, r, s, r squared, s negative one, so on, and as we have seen, uh, as we have seen before, if you have a word like this, you can keep using these two rules to reduce it to uh, a simple form like this. Know that all of those elements are reduced words in such a sense that no uh, adjacent elements are the same and uh, no zero power. So you can reduce an arbitrary word to one of those forms. Okay, so this is an example of a group given by generators and the, rela and the relations are, say, rules. A proposition that's very easy to prove, but you need to know a little bit of elementary group theory to, do, to prove, so we skip it here, is that every group can be obtained this way. I mean, as, as a quotient of a free group by, those, uh, by some rules. So in this, in this sense, you can kind of uh, see that free groups are some sort of basic elements in, in group theory, because every group can be obtained by quotienting a free group by some, by some rules. Okay, now let's turn to graphs and to trees. Uh, a definition, a graph consists of the following things. Uh, first of all, uh, 
uh, wait, uh, before I do the formal de definition, a graph is just something that looks like this. Okay, it has some vertices, has some edges be between the vertices. And uh, here, uh, technical nuance is actually, instead of viewing this as an edge, we view it as a pair of edges, one in this direction and one in this direction. It's just a technical nuance in this definition of groups. I do need it. It's kind of important for a purpose later, but it's a little bit not standard. So a graph consists of a set of vertices, those guys here, those set of edges, those line segments here, and two maps, uh, source and target. So for example, we have if you have this edge, it's actually two edges, this edge here and this edge here. The source map of this edge is just, it maps this edge to this element in the vertex set, which is where this edge is from. And T is the target map, it maps this edge to, the, to where it goes. And we have this reversal map, which maps this edge to this edge, which is just basically the same geometric object, just with orientation re reversed. Okay. And uh, definition, a path in a graph gamma is just uh, something looks like, you know, you start from some vertex and you keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going consecutively to wherever you want to end. So formally it's the sequence of edges, like E1, E2, E3, E4, such that the source of the next one is the same as the target of the, the previous one. Uh, maybe, maybe it's source here, a target here, I don't know. That doesn't matter, whichever way you like. And the circuit is a, it's a path which start and end at the same vertex. And we also require it not to have any back and forth edges. What is a back and forth edge? So, so this is an edge and you have a path that go, go, go here and go here. You cannot immediately go back. Okay, so if you go back immediately, this is, let's call it an, a back and forth edge. We do not allow such sort of things. So a circuit is just something, uh, for example, circuit is something like maybe you start from here, you go 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 back to this vertex. This is an, so this is an example of a, of a circuit. And we define a, a, a tree is a graph without circuits. For example, something that, that looks like this. It's a tree. And this guy here is not a tree because it has some circuits. We define the action of a group on a graph as follows. So uh, well, what does this mean morally? It means that we realize this group G as uh, as a group of symmetries of this graph. So for every element G in G, we realize this element as, as a symmetry of the graph. So first, what does it mean? It means that uh, we, we have bijective maps, FBG, which maps vertex, the, the vertex set to the vertex set, FEG, which maps the uh, set of edges to the set of edges, such that the source, like um, all of the structures of the graph, are preserved. So it's so we have uh, such an uh, we have such an edge E here is going to be mapped by G to uh, F E. G of E here. It's also going to map this vertex to some element, this vertex to some other element by, oh, so it's F E G. 
it's FVG, FVG. We require that uh, this vertex is a source of the edge is again mapped to the source of this edge. So this guy has to be mapped to this guy here. So this guy as a target of this edge has to be matched to the target of this edge as well. And you have the reversal of E, it also needs to be mapped to the reversal of E here, which means this G preserves the structure of the graph, so it's a, it's a symmetry of the graph. And uh, so for every element G, we it realized as a symmetry of the graph this way, needs to satisfy the following uh, requirements. So we have two elements, the multiplication of them uh, the as a symmetry of the graph is the same as you compose these two symmetries of the graph. This just means the group multi multiplication in this group G is the same as you composing symmetries for this graph. And uh, the identity element acts on this graph as just the identity symmetry. You don't change anything, everything gets mapped south. The inverse is inverse, that's all. So for convenience, instead of uh, writing FBG, FEG, we will just write G of V, uh, G of E for convenience. Uh, is this part clear? Any questions so far? Okay, good. All right, so another definition. Once we have a group G acts on a graph as above, uh, such that it never maps an edge to its reversal, again, just uh, some technical condition, uh, then we can define the quotient graph. First of all, we define the orbit. For, uh, for vertex V in the graph, we define the orbit of this vertex to be just the set of vertices which can be obtained uh, from V by, uh, by, some, by, by acting some G on it. Okay, and the same thing for edges. So this is called the orbit of V, and this is called the orbit of E. Those are sub uh, subsets of the vertex set and the edge set, respectively. Then we can define the quotient graph as follows. The vertex set of the quotient graph is just the set of vertex orbits, and the set of edges is just the set of edge orbits, the source, target reversal are defined in the obvious way. The source of this orbit is the orbit of uh, the source. So on, you can check that these are well defined. Because, because each of this G needs to preserve source and target. So um, very easy to check that those are well defined. An example is as follows. So this is a graph has four vertices. Uh, eight edges, because each edge is actually a pair. So this uh, Z2, the group with two elements as we, the butterfly symmetry group, as we talked before, it acts on, it can act on this graph by rotating. So identity just maps just trivially, it doesn't change anything. V1 is mapped to V1. And this element G, maps by rotating this graph 180 degrees around the center. So it maps V1 to V3, V2 to V4, uh, this edge to this edge, and uh, this edge to this edge. So the quotient graph is this guy here. This vertex is the orbit of these two vertices, and this vertex is the orbit of these two vertices. So it has two, ver two vertices and uh, uh, two pairs of edges. So this, this edge gets mapped to this edge. So th th this is the orbit of this edge. And, and as well as this one. And this is the orbit of these two pairs. 
we define a group action to be uh, free if for any non-identity element g in the group g, um, it does not fix any vertex, which means it never maps a vertex to itself. For example, this action here is free because v1 is not mapped to itself by g. Okay, the main theorem today is the following. A group G is a free group if and only if it can act freely on a tree. As a corollary, we have the so-called Newton uh, Schreer theorem, which says every subgroup of a free group is free. Because obviously if a, if if a group G acts on a tree freely, then any subgroup also acts on the tree, right? You're by acting on a tree, you're just writing every element in it as a symmetry of the tree. So if you have a subgroup, uh, did I define subgroup? Sorry, a subgroup is just a subset, as a set is a subset of a group such that uh, the multiplication is closed. Uh, so H is a is a sub as a subset, the subgroup. If for any x y in H, uh, x times y is also in H. It's just a subset such that if you mul multiply two elements in this subset, you also get an element in this subset. So naturally get a, a, a group. Yeah, so this theorem says that every subgroup of a free group is also free. Because if you have an action of the group on the tree, it naturally induces an action of a subgroup on the tree as well. If a group acts freely, which means no non-identity element fixes any vertex, then of course it is true also for any every element in this subset as well. If it's not identity, then it doesn't fix any element. Uh, any questions so far? No? Great. Let's prove the only if direction of the theorem which says if a group is free, then it acts freely on some tree. For this to, uh, to prove this, okay, let's take fx to be a free group. It's a free group generated by some set x. We define the graph of this group fx to be the following thing denoted by gamma uh, fx. So the vertex set is just uh, fx. And the set of edges consists of the pairs. The first element is an element in this group fx. The second element is either an element in this set of generators x, or it's the inverse of some element in x. Uh, the source of such an edge is defined to be g. The target of such an edge is defined to be g times x. So what it really means is that you have this, uh, this set fx here. So every element, every vertex is an element in this group. So between two vertices, there is an, there's an edge. So G1 here, G2 here. Between two vertices, there is an edge, if and only if you can go from G1 to G2 by right multiplying some element X, either in X or uh, X inverse in X, right? So there's an edge between G1 and G2 if either g2 equals to g1 times some element x in x 
are g2 equals to g1 times some element x inverse, where x is in x. Okay. So this is uh, edge going from g1 to g2. The reversal is, of course, defined to be, so we have uh, g is the source and gx is the target. This edge goes by right multiplication with x. So the reversal is, of course, it has source gx. Uh, the, the edge is by um, right multiplication with x inverse. That's how we define this graph of uh, this free group fx. X, as an example, let's look at uh, this x. Let's look at when this uh, set of generators has only two elements, a and b. So fx is a free group generated by two elements. And then it, its graph looks like this. Each vertex, as you can see, and label them, is some element in this free group, some some kind of some reduced word. And um, those edges, uh, let's take this one as, a, as an example. We have this identity element one here. So from one, we have four edges connected to it because we can write multiply one by a, which goes from one to a. We can write multiply it by b, which goes from one to b. And uh, we also have multiply by a inverse and by b inverse. So it can go to four directions. And uh, so this edge is the edge 1a, right? 1 is the source and a is how you multiply. And from a, it also has four directions to go. It can go back, which is just by multiply by a inverse. It can also go here by multiplying by b. It can also go here, multiply by a. It can also go here by multiply b inverse. You got AB here, you got A squared here, you got AB inverse here. Similarly, from this element, if you don't go back, then you have three other directions to go, and so on. So intuitively, you can see that the graph of a free group defined this way is going to be a tree. Right. It's, it's an, inf it's an inf infinite tree, though, even for the most simple case. So it goes further and further to infinity. It's an infinite tree. So um, to, to say this is a tree, if you have a circuit, uh, I, I won't show it fully here, but if you have a circuit, then you can uh, write like this A, AB, AB inverse, and so on. You get some reduced word. It cannot be one because it's a. That's the part uh, I, I said before that it takes a couple of lines to prove for the associativity of definition of free group. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to prove it here. So, so anyway, such a graph is is a tree. I hope it's intuitively believable. Uh, and uh, this free group can act on this graph by left multi multiplication. How it works is we have an element G in this group. How does the map a vertex to a vertex? It, it maps this vertex G prime, which is also an element in Fx, by left multiplying it by G. Note that in, in the graph, when we go from a vertex to the other vertex uh, by an edge, we use right multiplication. Here we use left multi multiplication. This is kind of crucial in checking that this is well defined. Yes, what do we do? How does it map an edge to an edge? The source is of course mapped to this guy here, of course. Uh, the multiplication doesn't change. So for example, you have this this edge here. The element B is going to map this edge to uh, 
this edge here, right? It maps one uh, to B, it maps A to B times A, it maps this edge one A to this edge B A, right? You go from B to B A by multiplying A. And this action is free because this G, if it's not the identity, it cannot fix any element. It fixes the element G prime if and only if G equals to one, because you can just multiply both sides by G prime to the next one, and this cancels out, gives you G equals to one. So this action is free. A remark is that um, in this case, the quotient graph, if you remember how it is defined, or we'll just define it to be, you take the vertex set to be uh, the, the set of vertex orbits to take the edge set to be the set of edge orbits. This quotient here is going to be a bouquet of circles, which I mean, it's a graph with only one vertex. So the edges can only be something like this. Why thus? Because uh, this, this, this group action clearly can map any vertex to one. So if you have a vertex element G here, you can just use left multiplication by G, right? You have the element G, which is also an element in the group. You mu left multiply one by G, you get G. So it maps this one to G. So all of those vertices are in the same orbit. For any, for any vertex, there exists an element in the group that maps, um, that, that acts on one, whose action maps one to that element, so they're all in the same orbit. Th therefore, the quotient has only one vertex. It's a bouquet of circles. And on, that, on the other hand, whenever you have a bouquet of circles like this, it can be obtained this way, because you can just uh, just take x equals to the set of circles. So if you have a set of circles, you have circle one, circle two, circle three, or so just take x to be circle one, circle two, circle three. Okay, because an, an edge, consider an edge here, well, what is the all of the other edges that that are in the same orbit as it? When you ask g, when you ask on uh, edge by g, it doesn't change this part. So all of the on the other hand, every edge which um, has the same uh, second component can be mapped to each other by an element in g. So the edge orbits are precisely the elements in this set of generators X. So every bouquet of circles can be obtained this way as well. The, this, the circles are in one-to-one -one correspondence in elements in X. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, if no questions, I can... Continue. I'm going to define the fundamental group of a graph. Okay, if we have a graph and we have a vertex V0 of this graph, we can define the fundamental group of this graph with base point V0 denoted by pi1 gamma V0 as follows. As a set, it's a collection of circuits which starts from V0. And the multiplication is just given by concatenating concatenation and uh, reduction, which just by removing those back and forth edges. For example, in this graph, this yellow, this yellow guy, C1 here is a circuit, goes this way. This green guy, C2, is another circuit. When we multiply C1 by C2, we go along C1 first, 
and then we we'll go along C2, right? And go C1 first, and then go along C2. We can see this is a back and forth edge, so we we'll just remove it. We we'll just go this way. This is C1, C2. You can easily see this is a this is a group. The identity the identity element is just you 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 don't do anything. You stay here. And um, lemma is that different choices of this base point give you isomorphic fundamental groups, which we're not going to prove. But if you are familiar with the theory of fundamental groups, you 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 should know this. Okay, proposition. Say we have a graph, uh, gamma here. We can, and we have an edge E in this graph. We can obtain a new graph, say gamma prime, by contracting this edge. You just uh, identi identify these two elements, these two vertices, and remove this edge, going like this. Okay, it, it, well, of course, if this edge if it, if it doesn't look like this, so it can't contract such an edge, only if the sort and target are different. Uh, the proposition is that such an operation doesn't change the fundamental group of this graph. Because you can, you can obtain an obvious one-to-one -one correspondence between the fundamental group of the old graph and the fundamental group of the new graph. If you have a say, if you have a circuit in the old graph which that goes through this edge, then in the new graph you just do not go through this edge. Right. On the other hand, if you have a circuit in the new graph which goes through this vertex, then because this edge is this edge before in the old graph, and this edge is this edge before in the old graph. So we go here, and we go out here. It can only go along this edge here. That gives you a map between uh, the fundamental group of um, this. So this gives you a bijection between the fundamental group of the new graph and the fundamental group of the uh, new graph. It's obviously a, gra uh, a group isomorphism. A corollary is that the fundamental graph, the fundamental group of any graph is isomorphic to that of a bouquet of circles. Well, actually, this is only this can only be uh, proved using this proposition if you have a finite graph. If you have a finite graph, then let's just keep contracting edges. If this as long as we have an edge that connects two different vertices, we can contract it without changing the fundamental groove. And if we keep doing this, we will be left with only one vertex. That's a bouquet of circles. Right. Uh, if you have an infinite graph, it's a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to prove it here, but let's just uh, suppose it's true. Okay, a main proposition now is that suppose G acts freely on tree T and V0 is a vertex of T, then the fundamental group of this quotient graph is isomorphic to G. Uh, okay, let's denote by P the quotient map mapping a vertex to its orbit. A lemma here is that let, uh, suppose we have, uh, let, let me just use this picture to illustrate. Suppose this E orbit is an edge in the, in the quotient graph whose source is the is V orbit. So which means we have a vertex V here that lies in this V orbit. We have an edge E here, which lies in this E orbit. A priori V doesn't have to be the, the source of E, right? 
the lemma sheet says that there is a unique edge E whose source is V. There is a unique edge E prime whose source is V that, that also lies in this E orbit. And why this is true? Okay, let's consider the source of this edge E because they are both in this V, this orbit, that means there exists an element G in, G in the group that maps V to this vertex here. So we can just take E prime to be G inverse of E. Then, because they are related by a group element, of course E prime is going to be in this uh, uh, E orbit and the source of E is um, the source of E prime is the source of G inverse of E by definition, which by, uh, because G inverse is a symmetry, it commutes with the source map. So it's G inverse of source of E. So it's, it's V here. And why is this unique? Because if you have E prime one and the uh, and the uh, E prime two, then there's another action, say G prime, that maps E prime one to E prime two. Because G prime maps the source of E prime one to the source of E prime two as well, it faces V, and that's, that's contradictory to that G acts freely. Okay, as a corollary, corollary of this lemma, let gamma be a path in the quotient graph. So looking like this, starting from some V orbit and goes, goes on. Then there, there exists, so this is a V in the tree, in the tree. So this is the tree T, this is the quotient. There exists a unique, pa unique path, gamma tilde, that's in, that's in the tree before, the, before quotienting by G, uh, starting from a V and uh, gets, gets mapped to, to gamma uh, by this quotient map. And this is part that's called the lift of gamma. To prove this, you just use this lemma consecutively step by step. You, for this edge, there's a unique edge here, lifting it. And uh, for this, for, and it ends somewhere, and for this edge, you have a unique edge that lifts it, which starts from here, and so on. Okay. Well, I have two minutes left to speed up. Okay, so uh, now we define a map from a fundamental group of this quotient graph to G as follows. So if we if we have a Remember, this this fundamental group is the collection of circuits in the in this quotient graph, right? So if we have a circuit, sorry, we have a circuit here in the quotient graph, then we can just leave it. Or we can just leave it to a path starting from v zero. It may no longer be a circuit. Actually, it will not be a circuit anymore because, we, because this is a tree. But it's going to end somewhere, V, which is also mapped to V naught orbit. So there is an element G that maps V naught to V. So there exists actually a unique element that maps V naught to V. Then we define this map F of this gamma circuit to be this element G. Okay, so we define this map F by telling you how, by telling you if you have a circuit gamma in here, what is F of gamma? It's given this way. It's easy to check that F is a group as some of them. Uh, it's actually, yeah, I, I don't have enough time to check it here, but it is a group as some of them. 
So this is the proposition. If I have a group acting freely on tree T, then the fundamental group of the quotient graph is isomorphic to G. Mm, okay, we don't have enough time to go through this nice picture, but anyway, now we can prove the if direction of the theorem. The proposition above to get to get together with that um, we know before that every bouquet of circles can be realized as the quotient graph of a free group by its left action. That tells us uh, the fundamental group of a bouquet of circles is free because the fundamental group of a bouquet of circles is the fundamental group of such a quotient graph, which is isomorphic to this group by, by this proposition. Right. So the fundamental group of a bouquet of circles is free. Okay, now let's prove the if direction of the theorem which says that if a group G acts freely on tree T, then uh, G is uh, free. Why? Because by the proposition above, G is isomorphic to the fundamental group of this quotient. But uh, this quotient is some graph. I don't know what it is, it's some graph. But we can contract those edges one by one without changing its fundamental group. After contracting all of the edges that is not a, a loop like this, we'll, be, we'll end up with some bouquet of circles. Therefore, G is going to be isomorphic to the fundamental group of some bouquet of circles, which is free. Therefore, um, G is a free group. So that's the proof of this. Uh, it's a proof of this man. Oh, where am I? It's my theorem. Here. From this theorem, as we talked before, we can derive this nice. Uh, I'll stop here. Sorry for a couple of minutes over time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank are you. there any questions? Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, could you go over the example that you didn't have yes. enough time to go over? <laughs> uh, you mean the this the nice uh, graph? <laughs> yeah, the nice graph. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, sure. So. Remember, uh, this is just an illustration of the uh, path lifting thing mm -hmm. of this uh, of this proposition here. So now we have uh, g g equals to f of a b, the free group generated by two elements, right? And uh, this this guy here, as before, is the uh, graph associated with this group. Mm -hmm. And um, this group acts freely on it by left multiplication. And by taking the quotient, we can map this graph to uh, to this graph here. It's a bouquet of circle. Um, as one bird has one vertex and uh, two pairs of edges because so consider all of the edges in this in this graph uh, all of such edges which is going from one element one uh, vertex to the other by right multiplication with either with a uh, are all of those right edges I wrote here. They are going to be mapped uh, to the same edge here, which is this A here. 
they are, they are going to be in the same orbit. And uh, similarly, there are, sec there are a second type of edges, which are the blue edges here. For those edges, they go from one vertex to the other by multiplication by B. So those are all on the same orbit as well. They are mapped to the same element, which is this edge here. Of course, we also have uh, the reversal. I just didn't draw them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the way you lift a path here is, for example, I have a path uh, gamma equals to say a b a inverse, for example. So it's this path a b uh, a inverse it goes this way. How do we lift it? to start from, for example, let's see this vertex. Uh, we'll just go this way. From this vertex, um, we have we, we want to lift this red edge. So it can only go in this direction, right? This is A. This is this is A inverse. So it can only go into A. So it has to go this way. And once we arrive at one, we need to go into some B edge. So it can only go this way. And once we arrive at this vertex, it has to go to some A inverse edge. So it has to go this way. And it's going to end up here. So that's how, so this path is the lift of gamma. So we have a circuit here. It's going to be lifted to a path. It's not going to end at the same element, at the same vertex. Uh, as where it started, but there's going to be a group element G equals to um, what is this? Uh, equals to this element. Uh, so Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, I think I have some issue with uh, convention maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm no. I kind of think I did something wrong, but I don't. I don't know where it is wrong. All of the arrows. Oh, uh, is the 
instead of right multiplication by a, it has to be left multiplication by it has to be yeah left multiplication by a thing Let me see if I, I did some definition wrong. Maybe this should be right multiplication instead of left multiplication. Um, it's okay. Maybe we can like see if anyone else has any questions and then we could come. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about this. That's I okay. guess I guess some minor point is got wrong and uh, didn't it's get okay. the. No problem. Uh, sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, does anyone else have any question? Okay, I don't see anyone. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so if anyone wants to stick around, they can, I don't know, they can chat and everything. It's open from now on. Um, Okay. Virtual applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.